Hi guys. In this episode, I'm going to be discussing some of the problems we encounter when we try to talk about personal identity. So, the reason we need personal identity is when we're talking about people, we treat them as if they exist over time. Now, I know this sounds really weird, but it does feel normal. Of course people exist over time. The person who did the introduction to this video is the same person as the one talking now. We're the same George. Likewise, the woman who gave birth to you and the woman who maybe texts you because you don't call her enough while you're at uni, we think of them as the same person. They're both your mum. And they're the same mum that spans across time. So we need to now kind of explain how someone can be the same someone across time. And this is where we kind of get into a lot of messy problems. So the easiest knee-jerk reaction for tracking any kind of identity, so the same for personal, is that we try to say that they're physically continuous, as in, it's the same object now as it was then, so it's the same object existing between those two spans of time of checking it. And that does kind of work for objects, but the problem is they don't work for anything that changes between the two points. So this is where we come in with the problem of the paradox of the ship of Theseus. So the story goes that there was a famous flagship called the ship of Theseus. But over time, of course, the planks got old or damaged or started rotting out. So they were taken off the ship and replaced with new planks. And obviously as this process goes, you've got one plank come off, then two planks, and over time they're replaced. And the old planks are put in a cupboard somewhere, hidden away. And so then you ask, say 10 years later, when every plank of that ship has been replaced, we all kind of assume it's still the ship of Theseus. But the problem we have is if all of those rotten old planks that were hidden away in the cupboard were then taken out again, and built into a ship, because there's one of each of them. Which one is the ship of Theseus? Because there can only be one. Is it the one that's undergone change and is now new? The one that we thought it was the whole time when we were placing each individual plank? Or is it the one that we rebuilt out of the rotten planks? And the problem we get here is if we say it's the new one, then we're not tracking physical continuity because it's made out of a completely new components of boat. But if we say that the rotten old planks make the old boat, then as soon as that first plank was taken off, that boat that was sailing around wasn't the ship of Theseus. And then if you accept that, then surely as soon as one tiny change happens, like say someone catches a shoe on it and chips a bit of wood off one of the planks, then surely that ship is different from the ship of Theseus and it's just a new boat. But obviously we don't think that every time a tiny bit of wood comes off it's a new boat completely. But the, if we're tracking physiological continuity, we should do. And this is kind of the problem we have of our intuitions just can't make sense of this paradox. And later, we will come back to how Hume wanted to fix this problem. But for now, we're going to move on to how Locke wanted to provide us with personal identity. So Locke thought, obviously, physiological continuity isn't going to work. Because otherwise, as soon as you lose a hair cell, or your skin cells leave, or the tiniest change happens to you, you're a different person every time, and that's just not what we're trying to get at all. So he thought, what about psychological continuity instead? And he thought that this personal identity could then reach through time as consciousness and memory, and it would connect the past you to the current you through your thoughts. And so to explain with a quote, self is that conscious thinking thing, whatever substance made up of, whether spiritual or material, 
simple or compounded, it matters not, which is sensible or conscious of pleasure and pain, capable of happiness or misery, and so is concerned for itself as far as that consciousness extends. And that's, this quote's a bit messy, so I'll give you another one and then I'll kind of mesh the two together and explain kind of what he meant. The second one is, a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places which is done only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and it seems to me essential to it it being impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive end quote so what these quotes are trying to say is, as far as you can remember, and as far as you can perceive yourself perceiving, so you can be aware of the fact you're having thoughts, that's you. And that kind of works out, but the problem is it falls apart really quick. So it does meet the intuitions of, say for example, sadly, elderly individuals who experience Alzheimer's and we describe them as not being themselves or say that just isn't that person they're not there in a sense and that's that's what Locke gives us he says so they're not connected to the person they once were so in quite a real sense their personhood isn't the same it's not the same person and that's an intuition that we want and he's been able to give us. But the problem is, he either has to be really strict with this, or really lenient. And whichever way he goes, it doesn't really work. So if he's really strict with what it requires to be connected to yourself through history, then, say, and this is an example he discusses, Say, for example, you wake up one morning and you forgot what you did yesterday. If that's true, then that's it. That person's dead. You're a new person. And that just doesn't work. We, we all think that, to give an even easier example, if someone were walking down the street and trips up and bumps their head, and then they're all confused and they've got temporary memory loss for about an hour or so, and then it all comes back. It's not just trip up and... Bam, that person's dead. They'll never come back. You can only have a new George. That, the George from birth up until bumping his head is now dead. It doesn't exist anymore. That's just not what we want. Because provided that my memories come back or I can be jolted and reminded of what I was like, everyone will still say, oh, well, that's, that's the same George. He's just got a massive bump on his head. That's fine. So this is telling us that Locke needs to have a lot looser approach to what psychological continuity is acceptable. It doesn't have to be direct in the sense. It can be indirect of you can be reminded of what it was like. So for the sake of having a sub 20 minute video, I'll take that as us accepting that direct psychological continuity isn't necessary you can have indirect so you can be reminded that you've done stuff and that's still you existing across time but the problem is if we now take this indirect approach and say that you can regain memories then we come with the problem of saying that psychological continuity in itself isn't sufficient for giving us real personhood so say for example in the same instance, I walk along and I bump my head, but then, for some unknown reason, some evil epistemologist, let's call him Tom for this example, jumps on my currently unconscious body and plugs me into a machine, and so when I awake, I fully believe that I am Napoleon, and I have all the memories and beliefs and ideas that Napoleon had, so I'm fully psychologically continuous with Napoleon. And since Tom knows that only indirect psychological continuity is now supposedly sufficient, then I should be Napoleon. 
then that doesn't make me Napoleon. It just makes me a really weird guy who thinks he's Napoleon. But to Locke, if you take the loose approach, then this should make me Napoleon because I'm psychologically connected to him. I have that psychological continuity. That just is what personhood is. And this is something that Locke does kind of account for, but he relies on the fact that, obviously because we can't access each other's minds and we can't check if they're right, he just kind of turns the problem over to God, and he says, well, at the end of the day, God knows what's going on. So he gave the example of, what if there was, a, say, a second person in you who was completely psychologically separate to you? Realistically, if they did something that was a crime, you'd probably get punished. And so Locke says, well, we can't in any real way ascertain whether someone's telling the truth or lying. So it just kind of sucks to be you. But don't worry, God knows it wasn't really you. So at the end of the day, when it really counts, you'll be fine. And that's just not what we're really looking for at all. What we wanted was... Where are people, and how can we work out who they are? Not, well, there might be a fair few people in there, but we just can't know, so let's just get on with it. But the problem is, Locke really can't get around this problem, because he says, as an example, the prince and the cobbler, of if one morning a prince awoke in a cobbler's body and was expected to spend the whole day making shoes, but still held all the ideas, beliefs, and behavioural mannerisms as the prince, and likewise a cobbler woke up in rich linen sheets in the castle, we tend to believe that, well, the prince is now just in the cobbler's body. Here we seem to have accepted that personhood does move through consciousness, not through physiological continuity. And in a modern example that shows this is teleportation. So, when you teleport, you don't actually move from one place to another. What happens is your body scanned down to the tiniest little part, tiniest little subatomic particle, whatever it is we've settled on at the moment, maybe quarks, I don't know. And then your body's destroyed completely. And at the same moment as it being destroyed, it's remade perfectly somewhere else. So, within your experience, all you did was basically blink and now you're in a new place and you've teleported. But none of the things that make you up now are any of the things that made you up then, other than your consciousness seems to move with it. So your thoughts are now in the new body in the new location. But the rest of your body's just been made out of the old garbage that they found out back. And this is an intuition that it really does make sense. It feels like psychological continuity is right here. But going back to our earlier problem of if we agree that psychological continuity alone isn't sufficient, then we still need that kind of holding down bolt to make sure that we're connected to the real life. But this doesn't work in teleportation because there really isn't anything really connecting the first person to the same person later on once they've teleported. There's no, like, actual part of them that's held down in the world that makes it right. So this kind of holding down criteria fails, because then if we say that psychological continuity alone isn't enough, then an instance of teleporting somewhere is actually an instance of destroying the individual and just creating a similar clone. And now we're by doing this, giving up the main selling point of psychological continuity that we were trying to use. So you scan yourself in, and it breaks you down, and that's it, you're dead. There's, there's no coming back from that. As a person, you have stopped existing. And there's just a very weirdly similar clone who's a different and distinct person from you that pops up at a very similar point in time somewhere else in the universe. So now kind of the selling point of psychological continuity has been undermined by the fact that we've added in this clause. So we've got to work out whether we want to throw the clause away 
all accept that teleporting actually does just involve destroying you and making some weird alternative. So that's been a lot of content to deal with in one episode. In the next one we're going to be discussing other concerns about personhood and other possible solutions, including animalism, and then we're going to discuss Hume's response, which is basically, people don't exist. End of conversation. So, (laughs) thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions or you think I've misinterpreted anything, again, please do leave a comment, and I will try and respond to them and possibly even change the video. And as policy now, I'm going to try to leave all references for quotes that I use in the description below, so if you do want to check it or just go on to do further reading yourself, you can find it again in the description below.